everyone uh, today we're going to talk about a very interesting topic which is uh, what women bring to therapy rooms so I am very excited uh, to be joined by uh, Reshmi today um, I'll introduce her when she comes on uh, but uh, I'm going to wait for a bit but uh, hello uh, to everybody hi Divi Hi. So as we're waiting for Reshmi, uh, feel free to uh, share, ask questions. Um, have, you, have you been in therapy and what was that experience like? Uh, any questions, anything that uh, you want, a particular that you want Reshmi to address? Hi Swati. Hi, another Swati. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Hitasha. Hi, Anisha. Gopinath. Hi. Connecting. Yay, she's here. Okay. Hi, Reshmi. Hi, Sangeeta. <laughs> it's so, so good to see you. How are you? <laughs> I am good. Yeah, I'm good. It's just uh, like unreal for me that I'm seeing you like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> it makes everything a little formal for me <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um, yeah maybe we can pretend that the recording is not on <laughs> yeah yeah because we've had so many conversations which yes. I think it could all be an IG live like we've had so yes. many when we were in the training Yes, yes. <laughs> so I'm just going to quickly introduce you. Uh, so Reshmi is a clinical psychologist. Uh, she has 10 years of uh, psychology experience. Uh, Reshmi and I met in somatic experiencing training. Uh, so we're both half mo a little more than halfway through. Mm. And um, Reshmi also does group analysis. And she works for uh, an institute, Hank, Hank Nunk, right? Hank no, Nunk. Hank Nunn. Hank Nunn. Hank Nunn. Just Nunn, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll share the links later, but they do some very, very interesting stuff, which uh, Reshmi is going to share with us as we go through this. Um, but uh, so we've been talking for a long time about a lot of topics. And uh, we just thought, okay, you know, I think it'd be interesting to, you know, to talk about uh, women and therapy rooms. So welcome. So I'm just going to start off at a very basic level uh, about why uh, women need uh, should consider um, therapy, you know, and uh, so, so I'll just start there. <laughs> well, I mean, it's for me, I think it's not so much uh, oh, that women need. Uh, I think men also need, I mean, more yeah. therapy, in fact. Yes. Uh, but uh, <laughs> But I think uh, from the perspective of like there is a, uh, you know, uh, statistics that say that women are more prone to depression and, you know, things like that. And sometimes that is interpreted as, oh, we're the weaker sex or we're more emotional or things like that. But I feel like that is the social thing. Like if you're if you're under like a patriarchal culture, uh, misogynistic, um, you know, backdrop. Obviously, you would be depressed. You've been told what to wear, what not to wear. You've been told, like, how to give birth. You know, all of these things. Obviously, you'll be more vulnerable. And this is to say about any minority population, right? LGBTQIA population as well. Uh, more vulnerable. Not because uh, there's something inherently more, oh, I don't know, biologically something wrong it's just that there's so much of oppression that it would be good to have um, somebody to support you yeah yeah and so 
and also i think as women uh I think we might be more open to therapy. Like there's so many therapists in India. Most of them are women. Yes. Um, you know, and even my own journey has been, you know, why I took, I think many people have asked me, why are you a therapist? And like, I remember thinking in 10th standard, I wanted to be a psychologist. And people are like, how did you know? And I'm just like, but I've been doing that all my life, like for free, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah, might as well make some money out of it. <laughs> yeah, I've been mediating between yeah. friends, between parents. It's my role, um, and so it just felt like, oh, you, so you you have an aptitude for this, but also quite sad, right? That you have to had to do that, yeah, um, from a young age. So I'm aware of yeah. that, uh, and I think many women uh, do this, like they parent become parents or parents to their parents and. Uh, grow up yeah. sooner so in therapy sometimes it becomes a place where you can feel safe become children again um you know be adamant and stubborn yes angry. yeah yes yes yeah. very interesting so many more questions from from that but i'm uh, just just so we can baseline it for the audience right so hmm. we 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 talk about counseling and then we mm. talk about psychotherapy we talk about yeah. clinical psychology and then mm. psychiatry right so if yes. you can just sort of help us understand this landscape a little bit okay so i tell you my understanding uh, it is used interchangeably sometimes and it makes it very difficult when there are laws that say that only clinical psychologists can practice right so right. then that makes everybody else redundant like then you right. can't do anything but do right. clinical psychologists know all therapies no so right they, so but my understanding of counseling is it's a short term uh, mostly solution focused work right. but that's not to say that i do know a lot of counselors who do like core psychotherapy work you know after a point mm -hmm. you don't want to give you don't you don't want to tell the patient to go away because you have a rapport you have a relationship mm -hmm. right. and then some of the counselors actually go on to study you know transaction analysis or mm. some certification of sorts that will get them to do a little more deeper work so mm. uh, psychotherapy is a little more deeper work in terms of it might be to get to the roots of where this is coming from something that right. is very conscious um obvious behavior uh yeah. where is it coming from as opposed to changing that immediately right so this is the difference between counseling and psychotherapy in clinical psychologists are uh, you know of course they can do therapy but again it's short term uh, it's more diagnostic um, and there are more assessments they we are uh, trained to do assessments to and, then, um, and possibly work along with a psychiatrist mm. um, so i know that in my training i did get orientation towards cognitive behavior therapy some mm. family systems work but it was more of an orientation and it's mm. only after that that i sort of learned more about psychotherapy and relational work mm. you know uh, yeah and psychiatrists of course um, you know uh, the main difference being that they give medication right. but uh, i've had the um, um pleasure of meeting a few psychiatrists uh, women again who yeah. are quite psychologically minded and they mm. uh, try to you know have also tried to because they again what happens if you're a woman and you're a psych psychiatrist is more women come to you yes and they want to talk and um i know uh, some psychiatrists who've also ventured into the area of psychotherapy because it feels limiting yes um, the medication alone you know it's very interesting as you, as when you were pointing out the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist and i was thinking it's probably the same as between a midwife and an ob whereas an ob is trained in pathology and to minimize risks and a surgeon mm. to perform yeah. surgeries and to manage quote and quote high risk or medically led pregnancies mm. the mm. midwives and the do uh, and the doulas who work doulas work in all kinds of settings but um, midwives are the ones that are kind of the doctors of nat normal physiology led births and it sounds yeah. like it's sort of that uh, clinical versus like 
not clinical in the sense that diagnosable medically mm. led versus mm. non medically led boundary yes. i guess is what yes. you're saying yeah 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 okay yeah. yeah so this helps right because i think we think that a lot of us think that if it's mental health we just need to go to a psychiatrists and pills but it's a lot more than that right yes. um yes. Th- so um when i when we announced this topic uh women were sharing uh with me how mm. uh, some of them had shared their experiences of finding the right care provider and how mm. that is kind of the i mean the right therapist right so the mm. and how that's a trial and error process yeah. um i'm wondering if we can kind of so you are so if we uh, if the therapist identifies as a woman and her client also identifies as a woman and so they are both bringing what do they bring into that therapeutic relationships from an individual as well as a collective standpoint so i i'm wondering mm. if we can talk about it in those terms mm 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 i definitely think that you know there's a lot of commonality like it's not uh, it's getting off a bit i'm back can you hear me yeah um but your screen is frozen it's sort of moving uh don't i think it'll fix itself in the recording so yeah oh, okay. i i can see okay. so okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay so um i was saying that uh, if if it's a woman a person who identifies as a woman there's a lot of commonality in the social um you know the social context um the individual stories might be quite different but yeah. uh, the social context of it um, might be sort of similar in terms of patriarchy body shaming um mm. you know mis- misogyny and you know mm. things, so, sort of all all of these things uh sometimes be- uh, uh a, a collective common um history in some ways right right can you hear me yeah i can i can uh, i can't see you much ah, it's kind of okay not... it's a bit um i i can hear you so let's just keep going because i, I think can you see me simple. yes i can see you uh i'm trying to switch off the comments so i can see you a bit better uh i'm just figuring out okay. how to do that uh oops sorry yeah this is not keep going keep going yes i can see you you're on the bottom half of my screen so i'm just as people come in and out it's overlaid on your but that's okay yeah hmm i can hear you yeah, yeah. so yeah so i think and also i find it easier to relate uh because of all of these reasons as well um yes. and i'm i'm sort of like when i have uh, uh, clients who are male then mm. uh, i try to limit it to an extent i don't i don't see equal number of male and female clients because sometimes it's harder because i have to really um uh, reflect on what's coming up when you know uh, if it's a male client i have to mm-hmm. really reflect on what is coming up for me as well Uh, yeah, and yeah. um it becomes uh, you know so you can't do too much of that uh so yeah. i'm i'm careful about it in that way but with women yeah. i think it is much much easier um and yeah. i think um, most of the patients i've had or clients i've had who come for therapy they've all mostly have been people who uh, uh to some extent are open um you know mm-hmm. to talk about uh uh things that uh, happen in their lives and um and i mm-hmm. find that quite uh, yeah i i kind of like working with women yeah yeah so um i i attended one of the your the webinars where we talked about uh, internalized oppression and in the female and it was a wonderful uh, 
uh, session, mm. uh, right? And um, mm. there was one quote in there that really stood with me, and it uh, I, mm. I I I cannot get it out of my head. I'm thinking about it a lot after that. It's about it's the Margaret Atwood co- uh, quote yes, about yes. what men fear and what women fear. Can you talk to us a little bit mm. about that? um so the quote was basically that said that uh, what men fear is being ridiculed um mm. and what women fear is being killed um and how uh, that affects our relationships even with uh, other women like mm. uh, you know if a if a dot if a mother is telling a daughter to kind of dress properly right for her it's just like oh be decent uh but mm-hmm. i but what um uh, they were talking about in the seminar was how uh, that is related to uh, you know this unconsciously the mother is fearing for the daughter's life you mm. know that if she dresses a certain way she'll get killed over this you know yeah. um and it's not just that people will make fun of her or people you know so it's a very like deep seated unconscious that and i i think i notice it with even with my daughter sometimes you know like mm-hmm. where i uh, i have uh, i find myself having differing uh, thoughts about um, something she's uh, she has to wear or something like that uh, for my for my son as opposed to my uh, daughter so yeah. uh, and then i find myself thinking about it that you know i'm actually really scared um, more than yeah. you know uh, and also like what will people think of me if i agree yeah. to this or if i let her be then they will question me as a mother if something happens to her yeah you, know, you let it happen uh um, yeah but there was this also this interesting thing that i was uh, a, i think yesterday i was just going through something um in terms of groups uh, yeah. women in groups and uh, there was this uh, i i i'm i'm don't know her uh, i'm pronouncing her name properly i think do- dr maya al hussain um, okay so she speaks about how gossip you know how women mm. coming together mm. was yes. uh, you know so when you think about gossip it's like a lot of women uh, coming together um yes. and how that was sort of demonized you know like yes. women coming together it's like uh, a threat um and how uh, i mean of course it's a threat to patriarchy in terms of when women come together yeah. in solidarity yeah right? but more yeah. than that um more than that there's also a sense of um when women come together that is the only way i mean w- when women don't come together like that is that is prevented solidarity is prevented that is the yeah. only way that uh, um the culture can actually uh, have us uh agree to some of these ridiculous rules right uh exactly. at some you're point so somebody so has right. said it's okay to have i'm sorry yes you're so so right yes yeah i mean there's so many things right like uh, at what point did women be okay with not working or staying at home and you know mm. at what point did they did they were they okay with sacrificing so in my head i feel like people haven't talked um mm. or even the uh of course we were not included in the decision even if we were included i think we were not given enough information to make a informed choice mm. so then it becomes like uh, in confinement i feel like if my mother is telling me to wear something you know wear this in this way mm. uh mm. i feel like already everybody has agreed to it and i am standing mm-hmm. alone yes. but imagine if there was a solidarity and people were saying you need to wear this we would say no i will not <laughs> Right. right and so there's so much of strength in coming together as a group um mm. as women because it is in itself it's it's a it's a revolution i feel and it's simple it's just a gathering of women yes yeah that rings so many bells like that, that hmm yeah and i feel like that about people you know like women resting like yes the gossip you know like judging of the ah. gossip is absolutely right right yes. i mean uh, oh who are you talking to what are you talking about and you know getting so curious mm. about that and also i think in in a modern day and age there's youtube and there's next you know there's more avenues for women to kind of collaborate and socialize but 
Uh, if you're in that abusive power hierarchy, all of that's going to come under the scanner, right? Including what kind of content you listen to and who you follow, and you know, it's about that not letting the thoughts be changed, right? Like the more, yeah. So it is control in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I think sometimes I even feel when women come together, they even play out this pattern of it being gossip. you know so it's mm. not just that so there's also the sense of secrecy over uh, over marriages there is like a secret you know like i can't talk about my marriage because then i mm. have nothing to say because everything is happening in my marriage individually or the oppression or small things that happen uh, mm. but i'm not supposed to say it because we're not supposed to i don't know bring our dirty laundry or something so mm. what happens when women get together is they just talk about um other people or superficial stuff so that we don't uh, shake the balance there and we kind of buy into that narrative sometimes mm. <clears throat> yeah yeah that sense it's and actually kind of straying away from the real group, conversations yeah and this is all questioned in a group in group therapy like when mm. we come in uh, are we here what are we here for you know are mm. we here just to talk about like superficial stuff uh why is nobody speaking uh you know talking and somebody somebody um Sangeeta were you able to hear? Yes yes I'm back. You keep okay. going. Yeah. So I was saying that sometimes we hear in uh like when women come together and somebody says something that is upsetting uh it's almost like the rest of them didn't hear it because there is no response to it sometimes. So in group therapy all of this becomes questioned like if mm-hmm. if somebody saying something is it so removed from you um or is it too close to you? that you cannot uh say anything so mm. um, it's about changing the narrative about these even the groups need to yeah. be conducive to get upset uh to have a, you know disagreements mm. um and yet to be able to um, uh, converse basically you know it's how can i have a conversation even when i don't uh, i don't agree hmm so when you offer a uh, small groups they're not curi- i mean anybody can join that group right yes yeah yes of so course, i mean you- uh, not uh, adolescents like there's an yes. age thing but otherwise yes. so can we talk a little bit about this group dynamics right because when we and when i when people think of groups they think groups of i mean pre existing groups and then you know you kind of work with the group dynamics right but if hmm. you're curating a group that is kind of organic and the women don't know each other necessarily how might hmm. that work in terms of the dynamics uh so can you walk us through that little how how would it work in in a therapy setting hmm. well um it is so group analysis as a as a um, you know a framework is very relational um okay. and it is about it is experiential so it's actually difficult for me to explain what happens in a group but okay. uh, you start you start depending on see like it's like individual therapy is like depending on one person and it's yes. extremely it's also it's you want it because you like you want that small that relationship you had in the right in the beginning right with your mother yes yes uh, that that uh, very uh, dependent um yes. sort of a relationship but it's also yes. quite scary because um sh- she's the only one and it's also uh, very one sided which is unlike any other relationship you've ever had in your life right no other relationship is other than the first relationship you've had and then maybe in therapy uh where you are important the therapist is i mean the therapist is not i mean i'm not going to tell you my problems so you know in therapy so it is unlike 
other relationships so sometimes the the uh, you know when you go out of the therapy room even though you've understood a few things it takes long time to, for it to show in your real life yeah mm-hmm. uh, because in your real life it's about giving and taking um and then in group what happens is if somebody is saying something so for example if i say something that's difficult for me i'm offering mm-hmm. myself to the group it's not that i'm taking time away from the group uh mm. you know so other people don't get to talk but if i say something that's upsetting for me then i'm actually offering myself to the group and the, and everybody else gets a chance to give and also mm-hmm. receive in the same at, at the same time you know to mm-hmm. think about what that person is saying and when somebody in the group responds to something you've said mm. um in a in a in a supportive way it lands in your body because that mm-hmm. person has no no reason to say what they're saying mm. even though me as a therapist in individual therapy also i can tell you that um you know it's it's fine or whatever i mean i might mm-hmm. say something but there's always mm-hmm. a sense of, of course you're my therapist right mm-hmm. of course you will say that it's like saying mm-hmm. of course you're my mom you will say that <laughs> uh, you know uh, yeah so oh, actually yeah group therapy mm-hmm. uh so if you're in the group and you say something to me you have no reason to say it mm. other than that fact that you're in the group and you want to say it you're compelled to say it mm so um yeah so it's very experiential and extremely it i, I feel like it includes the body simply by the community that that's a reality of our lives so sometimes it's easier to um make a change like since it's happened in the group and you have a like a community where mm-hmm. this is actually happening where you are speaking people are listening mm-hmm. and they are saying that this is really mm-hmm. it is really happening to you like things mm-hmm. like uh, you know a patriarchal thing that's happening in your I mean, mm-hmm. or a misogynistic thing you know mm-hmm. like somebody saying something mm-hmm. and they saying so what let it go uh, mm-hmm. you know all of those things mm-hmm. right you always hear that um mm-hmm. and you say that in a group somebody in the group will say no mm-hmm. that doesn't make any sense <laughs> and then you know uh you have somewhere where your reality is grounded it's actually mm-hmm. real and then mm-hmm. when you go back outside there is mm-hmm. a sense of um i have some place where this is real mm. so everywhere it doesn't have to be mm. i need to belong somewhere we don't need to belong mm. everywhere mm. so it so therapy is like that that you just need you don't need to you know have so many relationships where you feel belong you need right. to have one or two and mm. a group is a good place because mm-hmm. it's not just about the therapist a the group becomes uh, a place of belonging ah okay okay so i understand so maybe i and i just thought of if we if you overlay the polyvagal lens to it and about social mm. orientation and the need to social mm. engagement yes i think uh, this group setting is also a place where uh, if you had early attachment styles that was probably insecure or disorganized mm. it might give you a chance to kind of reorient and establish some of those safety mm. connection based uh, yes. cues that your body needs yes yes and and there are so many choices right it's not just with the therapist but with everybody and then collectively yeah. yes right? and it changes things um internally for you um, right and i feel and i i feel that quite uh, interesting for me because i'm doing both together like i'm getting trained in group analysis as well as somatic experiencing and yes. for me it really comes together for me right in the session um and i don't know if you've noticed it as well in our uh, so sc training yes. how the group we're trained in a group um uh, yes and how there's so much of this connection um of course this i mean online makes it difficult but when we were mm-hmm. there together um, yes i mean i've not met you before before that yes but it you know it just took that much time yes. to connect and talk so yes yeah yeah that makes so much sense i'm going to segue a little bit into something that we've started talking about in sc as well but i just wanted to mm. uh, unpack this concept of therapy being you know 
set in that individual body and that individual context but then there is a larger collective context in which a lot of trauma is rooted right mm. so we can't really i don't know if we can really um separate the individual from the collective and my um you and i have talked about it in various ways i think but mm-hmm. for me i think the question is um in a culture that is essentially hierarchical whether it's patriarchy whether it's colonial white first uh, you know version of privilege whether it's race or whatever it is mm. i think anything can be weaponized right and mm. uh, you sort of see this now where this well regulated nervous system itself is being almost weaponized right like saying that you need this kind of privilege and you need this kind of therapy and you need this kind of books and mm. access and all of that and uh, well it's too bad if you don't uh, you know it's your responsibility to uh, take care of the, your nervous system and thereby it's almost like a like a um it's almost like saying that activism in itself is a dysregulated nervous system mm mm that if mm. the individual heals somehow magically yeah. the collective will heal which i don't do you see where i'm going with this i think the question yeah. is around how we have weaponized uh you know a well regulated nervous system as a way to stifle voices and kind of create this idea yeah you're back yeah <laughs> so what are your thoughts on this collective the, the systemic the social the collective and how we i mean i think that is the thing that uh, kind of mm. is bothering all of us at this point right is actually i think even therapy is at its crossroads right now in most therapeutic form uh, you know uh, um therapeutic sort of modalities Uh, mm. are pretty white cisgendered you know started in the yeah. 50s where the, we lived in a different world and it doesn't really mm. and and a lot of uh, institutions are struggling with that also right i don't mm-hmm. think it can exist in that silo anymore where we yes. control access and say uh, you need to have x amount of money you know even in india right all of the therapeutic modalities that people are being trained on comes with a certain kind of money and time uh, thing yeah. which not all of us can afford so inherently you know uh, talk to us a little bit about that i think you know sort of the collective versus the individual but also what we can do you know where do you see mm. uh, our role in that setup um well when you said the uh, weaponizing of a well regulated nervous system um i think that people see it as a dysregulated nervous system like you said you know like oh you're a drama queen or you know you're just making too much noise or yeah. you know you're not you're always upset uh, you yes. know why can't you just let it be you know so actually yes. the person has a well regulated nervous system that is that is actually giving them uh, messages that the world outside is not okay all of this mm. is not okay uh, and uh, and the fact that um, it doesn't stop with you uh, and i think i've mm, i have felt this about me that i have felt that it's no longer enough that i'm okay i need to change things uh, just around me speak up a lot more uh, you know for for other people for myself um and of course it begins with yourself but then you just it's like you cannot um uh, i think a lot of a lot of patients talk about it, like oh when my trauma is over you know like once i finish this but there is so much more and once you if you make space once you work it's like you notice more you notice so much of more shit around you you know yes. which, which you yes. which earlier was was okay um, yes and i think something i i think something my sister sent me about this person who was giving this uh, story about like walking in the dark and you know you hit your so in, in in between it's like you wake up and you hit your leg somewhere uh, mm. you know and then 
uh, you think oh it's a you know it's a book and it's a whatever and then you realize um, as you um, as your whatever your eyes adjust that what you were actually touching was a lizard right so till then you know so so even for me earlier i used to feel like certain things were it's okay what is there you know all of that and then suddenly things start getting not okay um and you start questioning and it is the reason why uh, like things like witch hunts you know we think of uh, people women who've been yes. uh, uh, killed uh, as witches they you know yes. their uh, whatever infertile you know all of these yes. uh connotations of the women like midwives midwives sexual. were uh, yeah. midwives were always because midwives were also healers and yeah. they were very much in tune with the pelvis and their sexuality the mm-hmm. midwifery mm-hmm. and they were also yeah. death doulas right so they worked mm-hmm. in that energetic field of life and death and everything mm-hmm. in between mm-hmm. womb and, and pelvis and all that yes. and yes. and they were witches they were hunted at stake they're still you know it is happening in mm-hmm. some form yeah mm mm-hmm. so i see that as like so i think that somewhere as a collective we have also have to see if people have been tra- targeted um as bad or you know not at all good we need to see, maybe the way that they are presenting it uh, is very triggering like you know you you you're blaming me and all of that but can we sort of understand that it cannot be that all the bad is in one person uh, mm-hmm. just like any mental illness right how can it be that in this world there are only few people who are depressed we should yeah. all be depressed with the state of the country and the i world. agree right? i agree <laughs> uh, how is it that we have contained our sadness into a few people right and they are bearing that they are bearing that for us and we need to understand that like so all the evil is contained in one woman or all the you know the bad is contained for example even the sushant singh case right yes uh, mm-hmm. the actress contains all of the bad uh, yes you know our our guilt over losing this person yes. our our you know our uh, sadness and we need to mm. put it somewhere yes she's the one and she's demonized right she's a druggy and she's that yes. and it's like nobody else takes drugs like everybody else <laughs> you know is okay <laughs> Yes I don't mm-hmm. you know so it just it so I'm not I'm not saying that she had nothing to do I'm not saying that or that no, she I has understand. a well regulated nervous system yeah. but when when there is such a polar splitting um, yes. you know of good and evil then we need to be careful for me it's a red flag that yes. something that person is conveying we need to listen even though it's hard it's difficult yes um, we there's something in that that is uh, triggering for all of us and we can't sit with mm. um, it's either that you know sometimes some news articles make us bored yes you know oh, it's the same thing over and over again this kind of thing and that's yes. also something to notice that maybe you know sometimes when the anger is too much there is indifference yes that we don't even care um or it's the other way around where we are very angry and we put somebody as she or he is very bad yes you know they are the they are the reason why india yeah. is in this state yeah so it's the same way with like the you know the prime minister we can say this modi yes. but is it so yeah. he he can be characterized as a bad you know bad person yes. but also to think about uh, what is it that he brings up because because of him a lot of people have come up uh started responding yes it's not that before him there were very great prime ministers right like <laughs> it's just yeah. that he yes. brings something up for all of us yes and we've started to respond to it yes so absolutely so, yeah 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 So Tom, yeah I want to focus a little bit on this internalized misogyny in women and horizontal oppression right like women on women violence and I'm not even it's some of it is physical but a lot of it is sort of manipulation bullying and you see so much of it in all spheres right especially in the caregiving uh, spheres because yeah. somehow caregiving has become this feminine playground but we're still acting out a lot of that especially the um condemnation and tone policing of activism 
right mm-hmm. what is it about an angry loud uh, woman who voices her opinions that is so threatening to other women that they are uh, condemning activism or having opinions and and policing how that activism is there a place for it how how that needs to be done and all of those internalized things as a way to again shame criticize and call that w- w- woman you know she hasn't done her inner work right what is it about mm. women activists that, that are so triggering to other women uh you know i think that simply put i feel like um so imagine that i was talking about my marriage and it's not going well or i feel like you know whatever marriage is a structure that doesn't make sense or something like that i'm talking like this yes. yeah now there will be other women who will say who will uphold uphold this right they'll be like no you don't know mm-hmm. you are destroying our culture our indian culture is based on this and all of that mm-hmm. right yes i feel it is because for them if they accept what i'm saying that means that they will have to take an inner look into themselves so if yes. I, if i say yes you are right that means they'll have to also go back with maybe my marriage is not okay so it's um and also it women are also victim i mean they're also we're all victims of patriarchy right like it's yes. not just so uh, i i i find that from my position so there's so much of intersectionality as well right yeah. um in terms of um uh, you know your gender your uh, your class your caste um your sexuality all of this um yes. your gender identity all of this uh, you know yeah. coming together yeah you're back i think yeah uh so i was saying that how a woman might understand another a woman but if she is of a higher caste or a class mm. she may not or, or it could age, be even somebody age, for yeah. example any yes, kind age, of privilege yes. yeah yes yes so uh i and i noticed this uh, something uh, we had a conference in group analysis and i have i was part of a leaderless women's group uh, okay. which was really really amazing uh but there were a lot of uh, older women and and mm-hmm. they said something that you know uh, there is a there is something about older women that even men pay attention to like so mm. there is a status that's given to older women that okay mm. now you we now you're just like a man you know like something like that yes. <laughs> now we can listen to you and right. i remember thinking that i don't want to be listened to when i'm 60 i want to be listened to now No like, yes uh, yes i don't want to wait till i'm 60 which maybe you know they will listen to me then but what about now i yeah. have things to say i have important things to say <laughs> we all have important things to say yeah and it it would be good if people uh, listen to us now yes but it could be different things right just my gender makes people not listen mm you know or my the color of my skin makes yes. them just glaze over what i've just said yes you know and it's 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 very hard to pick that up and you can question it if you've noticed it yourself like yes. this is happening two three times and mm. can i question it and when i question yeah. it the re- the response from a lot of people who have that privilege of being listened to very easily is mm-hmm. what are you talking about you know and yeah and it's, it's it's tough you know it's tough to keep questioning it yeah then... yeah and also i think when uh, when we um pay attention to our privilege and blind spots ourselves i think there is more time to kind of work with it etc but uh, when it is being pointed out in some capacity immediately it triggers a lot of that vulnerability fragility mm. what about the but oh what about this and oh what about yeah. that and i don't know if people really what is priv- i mean people think that privilege is somehow like this black box hmm. right but i mean there are so much so many layers to privilege itself isn't it hmm hmm yeah and i think i've had uh, i i mean i've had a few people who i have mentioned something 
and then they have gone back and thought about it and they've said you know what you were right and one or two instances like that sometimes for me is enough i don't mm. want everybody to you know because i don't have the time i've yes. also thought about it in the sense of i can't uh, convince everybody no. i don't want to anymore i don't want to spend time convincing right you mm. need to do your work when mm. i say work meaning my own yes. i don't know right but the more i spend time sort of figuring out ways in which people understand Mm. it is taking a lot of energy out of me and also mm. i feel small yes and so i say what i say and then i move on uh, yeah. and i feel like that's that's just like don't spend too much time mm. um you say what you need to say and something yeah. i read about how can we be more comfortable with being misunderstood ah oh, okay you know can we be comfortable with being misunderstood so it's like i do something is oh she she must be a slut yeah. oh she must be this oh mm. she must be you know uh i don't know you know many many things right yes <laughs> uh, but at some point if i'm feeling that oh you misunderstood me i'm so hurt i have to tell you it was not what i meant it's a lot like i'm doing this all my life right like just yes. no that's not what i meant and yeah somewhere that uh, what do you say for that thread of inner sense mm. of i will prevail who i yeah. am will prevail so you will figure it out if yeah. you are around me long enough mm. you'll mm. figure it out yeah um yeah. yeah so yeah you need a few people who don't misunderstand i feel yes everybody is just tough <laughs> true 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 so i mean coming back to uh, your offering you you're starting to offer online group therapy sessions yes. right mm-hmm. so um i'm going to i'll share that link or I'll, uh, on my stories and you know we yes. can look into it but um tell us like you know should we bring anything particular into that session or can we just listen um how does it work so it is a proper therapy session therapy session um, you know it's okay. you're you're required to i mean um so there will be an assessment session it's not that i will just put you into group there will be okay. an assessment session which is individual meaning okay. you'll meet me and we will yes. talk about why is yeah. it that you want to be in therapy uh, yes. can we work together you know mm. what do you feel with me can mm. you do you think that you can relate to me uh, mm. i will speak a little bit about uh, what is the framework um yeah. and that might be one or two sessions also to understand their life story right mm. so yeah. it is important that you have had one or two good experiences in groups yes right? if you've had none at all and uh, then maybe i would i would suggest individual therapy to start with uh, okay. and then maybe um, you know after a few months then you might might join a group uh, okay. but uh, but if you've had a few okay instances in school or college or somewhere mm. you've had uh, some holding by a group then ah. it's a good place to you know so i'd assess these things also right. uh, have a, they have a chance to talk about their life story mm. um we also try and see if they can reflect so if, can you reflect you can you think about why are you saying this and mm. uh, wh- what does this mean and things like that um mm. and then following that into group therapy um mm. which will again be uh, it it is a commitment because see like individual therapy is also a commitment but it is depends on two people so yes. if say you don't come it's possible to reschedule it and things like that but in group yeah. therapy the group meets at a certain time every week right and if you don't come there is no possibility of reschedule yes uh, simply because it's a group and everybody's decided this time yes um, so these are certain things but once you're mm. in the group you are just expected to be part of it yes um, use the group yeah uh, as much as you can and of course i will be there so i if you mm. haven't used it and you're keeping quiet all the time then i will ask you uh, yeah or somebody will ask you i might not have to somebody yeah. will ask um, right yeah so it, it's it becomes a space it's not a training Um, yeah i just want to say that i it's not a training for psychotherapists and all of that right. uh, but it is it is 
therapy so it just uh, yeah yes yeah. just therapy and do you cure i mean apart from what you're offering now do you can also can you also curate specific group therapy for some uh, settings like say there's a team in a corporate workplace or uh, yeah. you know there's a collection of people with specific mm-hmm. interests right so mm-hmm. or people already know each other and are a group themselves so would you would this work be applicable to something like that yes yes mm. so in fact uh, my role in hankton institute is that of an outreach manager so okay. i do their uh, you know group work taking it out into the community so already mm. existing uh, communities so group therapy yes. is different in the sense that people who don't know each other come together yes uh, but uh, the outreach work is sometimes into communities and organizations schools in which already mm. these ex- the groups are pre existent Yes. and we go there and we offer group therapy support groups mm. uh, things mm. like that and especially during this time of covid yeah. uh, mm. we we are offering it to two or three companies where um, not two or three companies i think two companies uh, mm-hmm. where they asked for it mm-hmm. like uh, that yes. this time has been otherwise they used to being in touch mm-hmm. and yes talking and all of that and this becomes a place mm-hmm. where they can come in um and they can actually support each other uh, yes. through this time and if anybody feels like saying something they can yes um, but the goal of that is different that is support the yes. goal of that uh, therapy would be support if it's a support group. yes um, yes but if if group if it's group therapy it's definitely the the goal is somewhere it, in some ways it's changed right it's changed yes in whatever okay. way. it may may not be a good or bad whatever, mm-hmm. you know i mean you know when you yeah. say bad uh, i'm sure the families might say what did you do to my son or daughter <laughs> she talk- Hmm. Yeah, so I was been it's been really yeah, bad today. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just saying that uh, yeah, so people can say it's good or bad depending on which where yeah. is your you know. <laughs> I had I think adolescent parents come and tell me that what have you done? She never used to talk so much. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 we so all think, need obedience no i mean i think i saw yes. a post of yours on um, yes. disobedience somebody is coming on ig live yes. for that yes. i'm looking yes. forward to that um, and i think i was thinking about it like if if i have like an um, you know couple a husband brings mm. a wife because you know whatever she's depressed or mm. a parent brings an adolescent because she's mm. acting out or whatever mm. um the idea is do therapy so she's more obedient Yes, you know, compliance. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, compliance, right? It's all about that compliance. <laughs> And I can tell you, you know, group therapy is not about that. Mm. There will be no, yeah, it's not about complying. That's not yeah. what you will get at the end of this therapy. <laughs> okay. That sounds perfect, actually. <laughs> mm. But thank yeah. you, Sangeeta, for, you know, uh, supporting me with this. I mean, you saw my post and you were like, yes. you know, you should. No I think uh, more people we need it we need we need so much right i mean we need support groups especially now especially to this community of the the perinatal period right like pre conception mm, pregnancy postpartum mm, mm. there's a lot of need for that right and my gut mm. sense has been that we should be doing something in groups so which is why i mm. when i saw your post i'm like this is perfect i think people need to understand how effective this can mm. be and uh, yes. so more people and you know what you can bring a friend you know one of the big barriers is that embarrassment of turning up to that one on one session for example which i mean once you make that mm. therapeutic connection it's fine but maybe you take a friend to support you and then something that you do together right so i think it's it's a great option that's why it's um, like it's, so we sh- we usually yeah if it's support group that's okay but usually if it's group therapy we we again yeah. uh, try to see if the boundaries can be to maintain that you don't have friends in a group of course right. um, yeah, yeah but that's yeah but the idea is that the group will be supportive and you will right. have a place 
to belong yes um, it yeah can't, i can't explain it i think i i embody so much of the group uh, yes. that i find it very hard to write about um, yeah uh whereas yeah. i think with the body the mm. training that we do mm-hmm. i can write about it yes uh, even though it's experiential there is so much that comes out of that as language mm you know yeah interesting weird. yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you Somebody so much somebody just called so, so. the curly ladies yes. <laughs> it's so weird but i do uh, uh, many of the, like yeah swati she also like there's quite a few of curly head friends in my circle yes. so yes. <laughs> a lot oh, of yeah. me that's a whole uh, different you know like curly hair has been a journey in itself right like oh, keep yeah. it tied up uh, put oil it's it's an embodiment of what i need not be you know exactly like, you know you know be decent uh tie your hair off and all of that and so uh yeah we were talking about the whole the other day. Uh, therapy here yeah. oh yeah i mean this is a seat of we were talking about shame one day in a, in a small group setting and we were like um, and then eventually of course it went it's a group of women and we went into body shaming and all that and the first thing mm-hmm. that i could come up with is like yeah of course i've been born you know so oodles of shame in my body and it's like where is it and i'm just like my hair because mm. you know i've been called I, i don't know right i mean yeah. i remember people saying don't stand in one place for too long the uh, the, the the crow will come and build a nest in your hair and things mm-hmm. like that you know like yes it's meant in jest but not when yeah, you hear yeah yeah every i mean i've heard um, in yes, the school as they, you say it you know, hair needs to be tamed yes yes yeah. yes and something like if there's some lamp with uh, you know lit somewhere or oh, don't stand close to it it'll all get you know your hair will get caught and it get yeah. on fire and it's a big joke i don't know it's just i'm just like now i feel uh, it's uh, I-, i love my hair so me too yeah. and it took yeah. a while right like i went yeah, through the yes. whole chemical straightening experience and all of mm. that stuff and then it's like almost coming back to the body and making so even the curly head groups i think is a radical act of women taking back their uh, hair when yes. you take that's what i'm saying right i think people think oh feminism wearing shorts why is she fighting for shorts i'm like all of those things are important right like my mm, hair is mm. important because when i'm being it's you know don't shame me for the kind of hair i have right? yeah. like i it, you know people think it's an external sort of you know unimportant thing but they're all the same right it's eventually mm. claiming autonomy over your yourself and your body yeah and actually i i uh, i saw this thing um, on uh, it was a small short film i can share it actually uh it's about this trans woman um you know who uh she she wears a wig right mm. and the and the whole series is about like her wig is so big and so mm-hmm. when she walks people have to move aside yeah. like so move aside because i'm walking mm. towards you mm. and that's exactly you know when i feel when i think that this is the curly hair is like mm-hmm. that you know people were like oh you know you need to fit behind a pillar so you mm-hmm. need to be thin your hair needs to be like tied up and so you're <laughs> invisible basically yes uh, but my curly hair it it stands out right if you leave it yes. open there is no way i can hide so yes. uh, it's yeah uh, it's quite amazing it's taking up yeah. space it's in it exactly like you said yes, it is taking out space. that invisibility it's like yeah exactly that <laughs> exactly that <laughs> I still struggle when uh, people uh, my children is like oh comb your hair do that do this and uh, mm. oh I'm going to take a birthday photo I'm going to send it away like tie your hair my little one of them have uh, my younger one has curly hair and when mm. I hear somebody say that it's like ah shut up this is what you did to me you will not do that to her her hair will yeah. be what yeah. came a um, you know frizzy knotted raster hair fro i don't care you know i'm not yes. going to traumatize that child <laughs> yes yes yeah yeah <laughs> i actually have been connecting to this bit about like where do we get our hair from 
you know mm-hmm. it's not suddenly i have only curly hair it's obviously my one of my ancestors has had curly hair yes so when i straighten it i deny so many women before me and i know that most people in kerala have curly hair but then you know there is that sense of oh 